Hey, are y'all doing all right out there? All right. You got me preaching again. Uh, what? <laughs> you guys are odd. Uh, this, this is a pure fundraiser, this one golf outing at, at the all ball course out there. And so find people that love to golf that want to give to something like these water wells in Africa. One thing you may not know is that Hy-Vee Corporation, their one-step program, does all kinds of benevolent, benevolent things. And one of them, they've already built about 30 water wells. And this year, coming alongside our effort to raise money, their one-step program is buying the first water well with $18,000. And then Elder Corporation is also sponsoring with a large gift to be able to help us build a water well. And, and they are our uh, cart sponsors. And so if you work for a corporation and you know the right people, would you ask them? There's a few other places they can sponsor and sponsor holes and corporations come along part. Our goal is $100,000 for this event. We have a single mom that's without a job and had had a couple of interviews. I believe she's going to get a job, and she could really use a little boost with a dollar blessing. So I'm going to ask some of you guys to, to collect that right quick, if you would. And while we're doing that, take your Bibles or your electronic devices, as they might be, and turn to Acts chapter 1 in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to talk about... Uh, the Holy Spirit language, and once I put that, uh, it says the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit language is my title though. I probably gave them that title and then switched it, and then I have actually switched it since the other title, and now I call it the ABCs of spiritual language because I'm gonna talk about the affirmation of tongues, the benefit of tongues, and the confusion, the benefits of tongues and the confusion of tongues. And when I say tongue, I don't really like that word in our culture because we don't understand it because we don't call languages tongues like they did. Tongues of men and angels. We call it language. That's our word. Because when you say tongues, I think of this. And I don't want to see your tongue, okay, and all of that. And so, uh, hey, before I get started, though, you got your Bibles, you're ready to go. Let me tell you about tomorrow, next Sunday morning. How many of you ever heard of Charles Crabtree, Charles and Ramona Crabtree? They're going to be here both services. Charles is one of the most prolific speakers ever. Uh, years ago, when the Assemblies of God was first formed, he was a pastor at First Assembly. He's the one that boosted that church to get it growing. His brother came after he left. But David Crabtree can't preach, uh, and bless his soul, he's in heaven now. But uh, we trust that he is. And his brother Charles, though, can preach out preach anybody except me and uh, and <laughs> you no know, he's he's really good and he, so we're really honored he was the former assistant superintendent of the general council in other words he was the assistant pope of the assemblies of god and uh, so he's going to be with us in the morning and at night there's an interesting thing happened we've never done this in 27 years but we're joining in a combined service with first assembly over at their church at 6:30 so this, those of you that would come out, I, even if you don't normally come, go and let's get together as two churches uh, and, and, and have a service together, and Charles and Ramona will be there. And when they were pastor there years and years ago, they started a go choir, a teen choir, a youth choir that some of our old people were in. And I'm not going to name some of them, but they're old now, and they're probably going to try to do teen music, and I'm, I'm going to go and laugh at them. And uh, no, but they're having a, I'm not really, they're having a reunion choir of this youth choir there. And then, because Ramona directed that, it was called Go Choir because they would go out and, and share the gospel and all that. And so I was talking to Pastor B. Roth. I said, wouldn't it be fun? He said, I wish I'd have thought of that. And so they're inviting us over 6.30 that night. Uh, we normally have six o'clock, so I'll be here for those that don't get the word to tell them, but that's what's going on a week from tonight. I hope you will participate in it and be a part of it. So that's that. Uh, I don't know of anything else I need to tell you other than thank you. So taking Acts chapter one, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit language, ABCs or tongues. Let me tell you, this is the problem in our culture, in the Pentecostal church. 
uh, and I'll explain why we call it Pentecostal in just a second, but, but that people get focused on tongues. And I'm talking about tongues or spirit language today to help you understand and to help you understand how it should function in a church or how a person should use it. And uh, I, I, I want you to know, though, I don't want your focus on tongues. Your focus needs to be on God. When this happened, those people that were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come knew nothing about a spiritual language or tongues. They just followed Jesus' command to wait. They waited 10 days together and prayed, and then suddenly this thing happened, and they began to speak in tongues. Okay, are you with me on that? And the problem is, is we get, to, we get this thing that happened, and now we don't focus seeking God like they did. We focus on trying to talk in tongues. You don't have to try to talk in tongues. It's not, it's, don't worry about that. Do you want to be, do you want to be filled with God and his fullness and his Holy Spirit? That's the question. Or do you want to live your life according to your own strength and pulling up your own bootstraps within your flesh, trying to please God and then basically be in bondage? Those songs we were singing talked a lot about that freedom and the holiness of Christ within you and the grace of God that flows through you to help you be free from the bondage that comes from the law and trying to, by the letter of the law, please God. God's Spirit has given us a new spirit, a spirit of life and peace, and that the Holy Spirit will empower you and guide you. He is the Holy Spirit that brings about holy living. And so don't get your eyes on tongues. While I'm talking about tongues, because it's confusing to many, people don't know about it, people abuse it, people are afraid of it. It's weird. Yes, it's weird. It was weird when it happens to, happened to me. It's weird, but so is the virgin birth. That is weird. And so is creation. Let there be light. Weird. The Bible calls them mysteries. We spoke of the holy mystery. The mystery of God's own son dying on a cross, his blood being shed and cleanses of our sins. If you think about it in the natural, that's weird. Okay? And the fact that you speak a language that you don't think of, that the Holy Spirit gives you that tongue or that language and you just speak it, but you didn't think it. It came from like a river up out of your belly, the gospel says, and it flows out in a language. That's weird. I'm sorry. It was weird to me. It's still weird to me. But I know it's real because I didn't want it. I didn't want it. All I wanted is it, whatever God wanted me to have. I didn't go seeking it. And just like on Acts 2, 1, and I'll read in just a minute, suddenly a Holy Spirit came upon me and it was so powerful. And suddenly I found myself speaking in a language the Spirit gave to me. And as I'm speaking it, I realize I'm speaking it, but I realize I'm not making it up because I'm not that smart. It's coming from my spirit. It's a spirit language. Now with that in mind, I'm going to take you through a teaching today and I'm going to yell because I'm passionate about it because there's times I'm yelling because I'm correcting stupidity, and other times I'm yelling to get you to, 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 to believe what I have to say. All right, Acts chapter 1. I'm not yelling at you, as I hope you know. <laughs> Verse 4 and 5. This is the words of Jesus. Are you ready? On one occasion, while he, that's Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. Notice the word gift, gift. The Father promised, notice promised, which you've heard of me speak about. Notice Jesus had spoke about it before. He spoke about the gift the Father promised before. It's not the first time. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John himself said, I baptize with water, but there's one that comes after me, mightier is he whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John said that of Jesus. We can call it the baptism of Holy Spirit or the fullness of the Spirit, but it's what Jesus does in and through a person. Are you with me? Does everybody see that? You see the word promise of the Father and see the word gift. And it's the Holy Spirit, a baptism. Now, this comes to pass in Acts 2. And I've been there for 10 days. I talked about that last week. And now we're in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The word Pentecost here 
is a word that describes it. It's 50, 50 days after Passover. It's a celebration of Israel, a feast of Israel that God gave Israel. And it, the Jews from all over the region and the world had come into Jerusalem because they were told to, to celebrate these certain feasts. So they were there of all kinds of languages there and from different parts. And people knew who spoke what kind of language, depending on where they were, but they were Jewish people come together. So on this celebration, it was for the early harvest is when the Holy Spirit happened to come in the way the promise of the Father happens. It's the promise of the Father. And look what it says. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all, notice all, all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the, the NIV, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The King James says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit gave the words they spoke. And suddenly they were filled. Suddenly they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, the first thing I want you to know about uh, Holy Spirit language, the ABCs, is the A is affirmation of tongues. In other words, tongues is not bad. The Bible affirms it in many ways. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says this. It says uh, that, notice Peter, that Peter had preached after this happened. And the, in, the, in the first part of Acts 2, after what I just read, it talks about all the different languages that they heard them praising God and thanking God and speaking of all the glorious things. And they said, these people don't even speak that language. How are they doing that? And some were marveling at it, and others thought they were drunk, but it was only 9 o'clock in the morning, Peter says. They're not drunk, as you suppose. And then he began to preach, and he said, this is what was prophet, prophesied by the prophet Joel. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he quotes the Old Testament, Joel, about what Jesus just happen. And so it's a pouring out of the Spirit. And it mentions daughters and sons. So it's both for male and female, by the way. There is no difference in God's economy through Jesus Christ between a man and a woman. Okay? I hate sexism. Is that what you call it? It's where you, you know, women can be used to God exactly like men. And their voice and their understanding and hearing from God we have a lot of prophetesses in the Old Testament. Don't tell me that women can't be used to God. That was a sidebar. Now, back. So Peter now, after he preached, he convicted them, and he told them about Jesus under the anointing of God that was buried and rose again. You crucified him, and he talked about their way and said, this is Jesus. And so they said, well, what are we going to do? And Peter replied in verse 38, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift. What did they call it? The gift. The gift, remember? Acts 1. Remember I pointed out the word gift? The gift of the Holy Spirit. 39, the promise. What did it say? The promise of the Father. This promise is for you and your children. And for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. In other words, whoever whenever, throughout the ages, the promise of the Father is for today and it's a gift of God and it's the fullness of the Spirit. You say, wait a minute. When I asked Jesus into my heart, I thought the Holy Spirit comes in. Absolutely. And Romans 8 makes it clear. You have the Spirit in you. If you've received Jesus, if you don't have the Spirit, you haven't received Jesus. But let me ask you a question. Because these disciples back then in Acts 2 had received Jesus Christ and been born again, does that mean you don't have to receive Jesus Christ to be born again? No, you've got to receive Jesus because they were full of the Spirit. Does that mean that every person throughout the history then that has Jesus is full of the Spirit because it happened to them? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. Does it mean that you're no longer born a sinner? No, we're all born sinners and we need Jesus to save us and we need the Holy Spirit to empower us to be witnesses and to live lives worthy of the calling God has called us to. Are you with me on this? Okay, so I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit is real and the Holy Spirit is in every believer and there is a moment 
that the Holy Spirit will empower you. <clears throat> I'm not addressing in, in effect what is the evidence or the moment the Holy Spirit fills you and empowers you. But I will address this. I think a prayer language is something that God would want everyone to have. Here's what the Lord says about it. If a father on earth, if you ask of him for bread, would he give you a stone? If you ask a fish, will he give you a snake? And the answer is no. He said, how much more when you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, will he give you the Holy Spirit of promise? I'm telling you that there is something. This is not a matter of class. This is not a matter of God will bless someone with this and not this person because it's not a matter of a certain class of Christian or a level of Christianity. This is just that the Holy Spirit has available for all of us a language to help us worship God and pray in. So if you'll stay with me and keep an open mind and listen, you'll learn a lot through this message. I, I, I promise you will. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 34, he tells them, uh, 38 to 40, that this is a promise for all of you. Then Acts chapter 19, flip over if you would. And in many times in Acts, in this particular time, but about four or five times, you see an evidence when they talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit that there was a spiritual language involved. In Acts 19 verse 1, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, look at this, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism, baptism did you receive? John's baptism, he replied, they replied. So Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus, and on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. And again, did he tell them that you were going to speak in a tongue? No. He said, have you seen the Holy Spirit? What happened? They were full of the Spirit, baptized, and they did speak in a tongue. Uh, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that when you are baptized in the Spirit and full of the Spirit, you will speak in tongues. It does not say that anywhere in the Bible. But we see this on an ongoing basis. And whether or not you believe that or not, it doesn't really matter to me. I don't really care. But I do want you to know that God has a prayer language for you that is a spiritual language that you can pray and worship God in. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture and try to convince you with the words of Paul and the teaching. So the affirmation of tongues is that it took place multiple times. It happened when the day of Pentecost was there. It's called the promise of the Father. It's the promise of the Father to the generations to come. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you jump over to 1 Corinthians where we'll spend most of our time now, chapter 14, and please use your Bible because I'm reading a lot of Scripture and teaching. So pull it up on your, just Google it on your chapter, just Google 1 Corinthians 14, pull it up on your Bible and, and that. So you, you'll get it. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 5, it says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, except especially the gift of prophecy, which is under the anointing of the Spirit to speak truth. Okay, to speak truth. It doesn't look like necessarily like what happened here when thus saith the Lord God was giving us a word of encouragement uh, earlier, but it can also be you're witnessing to someone at a gas station or at a restaurant, and you just go, Wow, I, I mean, you're saying this stuff and you realize these words and these thoughts is just quickened by the Spirit and it, you know that God's helping you talk to this person, okay? Or if you're teaching and it happens, or you're preaching and you have that power of that. And so he says, if anyone, and he goes on, he says, especially the gift of prophecy, for anyone who speaks in tongue, in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. When you speak to God, what is that called? Prayer. You don't speak to men, you speak to God. In other words, main purpose of tongues is to speak to God, not to men. They don't understand it. Look, it says, uh, for, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mystery with his spirit, mysteries. You know, he doesn't even understand it. 
I don't understand it when I speak in it. It's by faith, but I know it's the Spirit giving me the utterance. Verse 3, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And you'll see this in Paul's teaching, correcting the church at Corinth, who was playing spiritual king of the mountain. Look at me. Look what I can do. Look at me. I can talk in tongues. I can prophesy. I got a word. Let me do this. Okay, and it, it was out of control. It was, it was not in order. It was crazy. I've been in crazy places and crazy out of order situations. They're not pleasant. But he makes this point. He says, when you're in the church like this, everything that happens needs to edify everyone in the church so they understand. Do you get that? If you are praying in a tongue, if I am, you listen, you're not going to be edified. I may be edifying myself, but you aren't. But when I'm alone and I'm praying or worshiping in my spirit language, I'm building myself up. That's not bad. It's an affirmation that tongues is a good thing. And so you see that in, in through verse 4. Verse 5 says this. He makes it clear. He says, look again at 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Both of them are good. He says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. I would, King James says, I would that you all spoke in tongues. That's, that's affirming tongues. Is Paul affirming it? Why would he say, would you all, if it wasn't possible? It's not talking about the gifts in the church. I know you're thinking about 1 Corinthians 12 if you know your Bibles. Now I'll get to it. And then go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. Jump down to verse 12 and 14. It says this. So it, so it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. That's what Paul's point is. Don't be selfish. You don't come here to get. You don't come here to what, you know, it's about you. You come here to give. You're mindful of others, to build up, to worship God, to be about God and others. So for this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he interpret what he says. I don't like it when people just speak in a tongue and go, okay, pastor, see if you're spiritual enough to interpret that one. You speak it, you should pray, you interpret it, okay? And you need to be sensitive to the Spirit if you're that spiritual that you're going to give a tongue out for the church to hear so that when it's interpreted, people benefit. For if, it says in verse 14, I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. What is that affirming about, what does it say you're doing with your tongue? You're praying in a tongue. And who's praying? Your spirit, not your intellect. It's God given the words. You see that? And he says, but my mind is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm praying. The Spirit is praying it. How many of you with me? It's by faith. So what shall I do? Don't do it because it's weird. What shall I do? Uh, uh, get up in front of everybody and talk in tongues, show them what I can do. Listen to this one. No. What should I do? I will pray with my spirit. With my, I will, it says, I will pray in my spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind. In other words, understanding. I will sing or worship with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind. In other words, I'll sing and pray in tongues, but I'll also sing and pray with understanding. You see what he's saying? Do you get what I'm saying? But in church, if you're sitting out there and all of a sudden someone's around you here, you going off in tongues, they're going to think, what is going on with that woman? Oh, she must be from another country. She must be this. Don't do that stuff. It confuses people. Let things be done decent in order. If you're up here ministering to somebody, you, they better know that, they better believe in tongues and understand it before you pray over them in the spirit and the spirit language. You can ask them, do you know about it? Is it okay if I pray? That's okay. But if you go off on someone never heard it, they're ignorant of it, they don't understand it, and you start praying over them that way, they're going to, it's going to, it's going to confuse them. It's not going to help them. Okay. It says, I will sing with my spirit, I will sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, what is that, in a language? There it is. If you're praising God with the spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, your praising, since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man's not edified. In other words, you're in church, 
edify others. Don't just be selfish even though you're getting blessed by your spirit language. And then he clarifies. He doesn't want to leave you thinking he's saying anything bad about praying in a tongue or a language. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you crazy Corinthians that are using it out of bounds and being selfish with it and out of order. See what I'm saying? Someone, I got to one passage and I stopped just before it says, women be silent in the church. And people were nudging their wives saying, wait, look, he's, look at this one, look at this one. Women, be silent in the church. You know why? Because the Corinthians, it was a patriotic society, and so the men were in charge, and they sat on one side, and their wives sat on the other, and they, they were so out of control, they'd be talking about things and teaching, and the wife would yell across the church to the husband, what did he mean by that? And it was like chaos going back and forth. It said, when you're in a gathering, quit yelling across the church to your husband trying to get answers. Just wait till you get home and ask him. Or if you're going to argue with him, argue at home. Are you with me? That wasn't in my message either, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, and then the last one I want you to see, jump to verse 39. He makes it clear in case anybody, as he closes out the teaching on this stuff, he makes it clear. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. Why? Because that builds up the church, right? And forbid not to speak with tongues. Or it says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. And then last verse, but let, should, everything should be done in fitting and orderly way. Let everything be decent and in order. That's, what he's, that's the theme of what he's dealing with with this, this crazy church that were out of order and playing king of the spiritual mountain. I'm telling you a bad thing. But he affirms tongues. That's number one. Number two, tongues have a benefit, okay? And I'm hurrying. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 and 4. 14, rather. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak unto men but to God. The benefit is it's a way to pray. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Verse 4, another benefit, I'd like every one of you to speak uh, in tongues. So he makes it clear there's a benefit spiritually that you should uh, participate. Verse 14 to 18 again in 1 Corinthians 14. And, it, and I'm going to cut that short by saying I just talked about it. But when you go to verse 14 again, he, he asks the question once he gets through teaching on it, he says, what then? What shall I, what should we do? He says, this is what we should do. Pray and sing in spirit and pray and sing with understanding because you're giving thanks and you're doing it well. It's good. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. It's beneficial or Paul wouldn't tell you there's a benefit to speaking in tongues. In Jude chapter 1, the last book of the Bible is Revelation. And right before it is a little one-chapter book called Jude, starting in verse 17. He says this. Dear friends, remember that what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold, remember what they told you. They said to you, in the last days, times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. There are people that scoff the holy command of God in the way of living and call it old-fashioned and out of touch and mean-spirited and everything else when a standard of holiness is called for in this book. They also scoff at people who believe in supernatural. You even have pastors in mainline denominations that used to preach it straight up and straight, just as straight as it was in the book, who even question because it doesn't make sense, the virgin birth. When I was in Sheldon pastoring a church there, 1978 to 81, I was a youth pastor. The Methodist pastor in Sibley, Iowa, preached that it was all a figurative speech, the virgin birth, and it was a ridiculous thing. Can you imagine that? My goodness, I can't. But ungodly desires, they scoff, and people scoff at tongues because they don't understand it, because it's supernatural. These are the men who divide you and follow more natural instincts and do what, not what the, that, that which is not of the Spirit. In other words, in the natural, it doesn't make sense. But I'm going to tell you, he goes on. He doesn't, he doesn't stop there. He continues to tell you what to do. And, uh, and I turned, uh, turned away from it before I finished. He says, but you, dear friends, build yourself up. Is it wrong to build yourself up? He's saying build yourself up, edify yourself, build yourself up in the most holy faith. And what does it say? And pray in the Holy Spirit. And then notice what the Holy Spirit does for you. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The more love you got, the more the Holy Spirit you got, the more full you walk with God, the more love there is, the more fruit there is. 
And when you see a person that prays in tongues and they're meaner than snot and they gossip and they're ugly and they have a terrible spirit, that's probably the fake tongues of the devil, which he has a counterfeit for everything. It's not God at all. I'm telling you, when you're full of the Spirit, you don't act that way. You love God and you love man, okay? And your heart is to minister to people and help people, not tear them down. So I grew up in a church where there were people that were tongue-talking devils. I call them church witches. You can talk in tongues and be, a, be demonic. You with me? I know you don't believe that, but it's true. Okay, the last thing, confusion of tongues. Affirmation of tongues, benefit of tongues, confusion. There's a lot of confusion around it. <clears throat> so much so, sometimes I just think, God, what were you thinking <coughs> with all this? But who can question God on it, right? It's exactly what happened, and it still happens today. I know it. I didn't even want it. I just wanted whatever was real from God. That's what I said. I said, I don't even want it. I just want what's real from God. Nobody touched me. Nobody talked to me about it. I was more affected by my dad who didn't even know if that thing is real. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit whacked me and I began to speak with a spiritual language. Nobody had to teach me how to do it or coerce me or teach me about it or say, well, when you feel the Spirit there, you got to open your mouth and speak it. None of that happened. It was just a power of God. And let me tell you, I'd rather you seek God all your life and never speak in a spiritual language than get a tongue and walk around all proud like you're the holy one of the assemblies of God. I have talked in a tongue. I want you to walk full of God's spirit. I affirm that tongues is real. But look at this. Here's the problem. Is that we get confused what is meant for the church and what is meant for the individual. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the, the nine gifts of the Spirit. Starting in verse 7, it's not on your screen. It says uh, that uh, to each one is a manifestation of the Spirit given for the common good. Remember, it's for the common good to build for the, for the body of Christ. So these are for the church. These are for people in the church. To one, there's given to the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge. By means of that same Spirit. To another, the faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Another miraculous powers to another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits or discerning of spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues to still another interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit and he gives each one just as he determined. Now look, if it wasn't talking about for the church, why would he put the interpretation of tongues? When you're praying and you don't understand your bill, that's not what you do alone. You don't get alone and pray and then go interpret. Oh, I'll pray and my interpret my prayer. It's talking about in the church, folks. These are for the church. Now, follow me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Jump to 27, 1 Corinthians 12. It says this. Now, you are the body of Christ. Notice the body of Christ. This is a gathering of everybody here. The body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some where? In the church, right? See it? In the church. Verse 20, is it first, are we there? Verse 28, please. There. And God has placed in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? The answer, of course, is no. You're not gifted that way. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? In the church, it's talking about no. Do all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and I show you a more excellent way. And so people say, see, God has spiritual language for some people, but some people he don't. That's not what this is saying. It's talking about when the church together, in the church, that God uses us to build each other, to teach you, to edify for the church, and that they're not used by everybody the same, and not everybody has the same giftings. It does not say that Holy Spirit language is not for everybody to pray with. Remember, Paul, I would you all spoke with tongues. I speak in tongues more than you all. He that speaks in a tongue speaks unto God, not to man. They pray. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with understanding or with my mind. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with understanding. I've gone over all this, right? But there's confusion because we're confused with what's meant for the church as a gift as opposed to what's meant for the individual for a private prayer life, which is the primary purpose of a spiritual language. Are you with me? All right, if you're not understanding, re-listen to this sermon and write down these verses. I close with this, verse 32 and 33. 
jump to me in chapter 12. He says this. No, I'm sorry, chapter 14. Go to 14 again. Hmm, let's see. Okay, I, I need to do this one. Start, we'll start at verse 20. Uh, yeah, I know. Verse 22, tongues then are signed not for believers, for unbelievers. Prophecies for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everybody's speaking in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not think that you're out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody's prophesying or t speaking in language where people understand it under the owning of the Spirit to edify, exhort, and comfort, which is what the Bible says prophecy's for, then he'll be convinced by all that he's a sinner and be judged by all. In other words, he, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he'll fall down and worship God and exclaim, God is really among you. In other words, t the words you can understand convince people at teaching and preaching. And then he says, what then we say, brothers, when you come together, everyone has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All these must be done the strengthening of the church. And the Corinthians weren't doing that. They were being selfish. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most but three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. In other words, tongue, interpretation. Don't have another tongue. Not tongue, then another tongue, then another tongue. No. Tongue, by course, interpretation. Tongue, interpretation. Tongue, interpretation. And if you're in my service, I say, that's enough, that's three, no more. But it goes on, it says, everybody can prophesy one by one. That's what it says. Right there, Paul says it. He says, he says, but if there, and also he says, if there's no interpreter, if you talk in tongues, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. In other words, you better have the gift of discernment to know if there is. Or he says, and if he talks in tongues, he should pray that he does the interpretation. Don't just throw it out there. And it says, two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is said. And if the revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone can be instructed and be encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. God's not a God of disorder, but of peace. In other words, I've had this happen early in the church. I was giving an altar call and I'm talking. I'm in the middle and God's calling fish to get saved. And someone starts talking in tongues in the middle of it. I say, whoa, stop right there, my friend friend, you're out of order. I know you mean well, but stop. Why? It's out of order. You can't tell me that, that God made me interrupt your altar call. That's not of order. That's stupid. That's why people run away from craziness like that, right? Or, or uh, the, in the middle of a sermon, I've had it happen. I'm preaching. Someone jumps out in the middle of a sermon. I'm going, <laughs> drives me crazy. It's worse than chalk. Fingers on a chalkboard. Worse. That's when I say, God, why didn't you make me Southern Baptist? <laughs> I only say that as a humor, not serious. Because people that do things out of order, you got to deal with it and it's not fun. Are you with me? But the proper way, when at all possible, is to privately, quietly deal with it to show respect and not embarrass someone who is doing with their heart intended well that which is good in the spirit. So don't ever be afraid if you're well intended. These people that I called down were visitors. They would first time there. I didn't know them. And don't ever go into a meeting unless you really know it's God into a strange meeting uh, and, and go off like that, okay? So that's just, that's it. So God's not a God of, dis, of this order. So do everything decent and in order. I don't want tongues to cause confusion. But let me tell you something. God has a spirit language for everybody, I believe. And it, you, don't, you don't get the real thing seeking the language. You get the real thing wanting more of God. God can handle this, guys. He's not weak. And how many of you today, you say, I'm not, I'm not ready to meet my maker if Jesus were to come back, I don't think I'd go to heaven. You know you're not right with God. If you just come to this altar in a minute when others do and ask God to be merciful to you, a sinner, he will. He'll come into your heart. His spirit will make you new. 
and forgive you. And if you're here this morning and you want more of God as the musicians come, we invite you to come to receive more of God. You say, I'd like to be full of the Spirit. We, if, I'd like to have God bless me with his fullness and the same thing that suddenly that happened to you, Pastor, the Holy Spirit come up on me and give me a prayer language. I told this to one Catholic up in Sheldon, Iowa that uh, had gotten saved and he had hungered and thirsted for the Holy Spirit and fullness and to have this spirit language to be able to help him in his uh, daily walk with God that opens up all the other incredible miracles of God and he saw it and saw it and, and I just said to him I said some people just can't do it with other people around but if you're sincere God knows he was a farmer I said just when you're alone sometime he got out in the middle of the farm field knelt down and said God fill me with his spirit the Holy Spirit came upon him and he began to flow with a Holy Spirit language and spoke languages that he knew it wasn't him he went on to become a deacon of the church and Harry and Mavis can tell you, his name's Dennis Getting. It's a true story, I'm not making it up. And the Holy Spirit's the same, just as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know, if you heard me say something, ask me, please don't, you know, call me and talk to me if you heard me say something that you had a problem with or you don't understand or you disagree with, because I'm not, I'm not gonna say I, I'm, I understand all this perfectly, but I want things to be decent in order and I want God to be glorified and not man exalted. I don't want it to be about us. But on the other hand, I don't want you to be afraid of amazing power that does do those gifts of miracles and healings and words of knowledge and words of wisdom. There's power, there's more. And if you'll open yourself up, he will continue. And listen, don't forget something. We forget because it's like when we get the spirit language, we think we've arrived, we're spirit filled. No, spirit filling is daily. Ephesians 5.18, it's a continuous action verb. Be ye filled with the spirit and not drunk with wine words in excess, but be filled with the spirit. It's a continuous action verb, continuously being full of God's spirit. How does it happen? Through the word, through prayer, through uh uh, uh, dwelling with God through being open to that through receiving and connecting in a spiritual level and one of the big things is fasting because it, it does pulls down the flesh it wants to think in the natural and not experience the supernatural are you with me